Someone else who has been uh, somewhat critical, dubious of that, has been John Holt. He's written four books, including How Children Fail in 1964, which has been recently updated, How Children Learn in 67, The Underachieving School, and a book called What We Do Monday Morning. He is from John Holt Associates in Boston, and I welcome you to the program. Hi. <coughs> Actually, that's nine books, but... <laughs> nine? You must have got a hold of an old sheet, yeah. I must have got the abridged bibliography. Uh, something like that. Tell me, first of all, uh, a lot of people you mentioned have been calling you and trying to get your comments on the report, A Nation at Risk, and I'd like to first find out just how credible uh, this type of report is in your eyes. Well, I think I agree with what it says, uh, that uh, schools are in terrible shape. But um, reports have been saying that every five or ten years since 1946, which was the first time I was old enough to pay attention. And I dare say if we went back into the 30s and 20s, we would have found similar reports. So uh, this is nothing new. About every at least once a decade, and usually more than that, we get some kind of a big body looking at the schools, and they always come up with the same conclusion. Uh, and uh, th But generally speaking, their recommendations, like Mr. Lupo's, are always based on the same wrong assumptions, and so uh, their recommendations, even when we follow them, don't make the situation any better. In fact, they usually make it worse. Well, what has been the aftermath of these frequent reports in general? Well, more more reports. Uh, I mean, none of them have done any good. We'll go back to 1946. At that time, there was a big uproar all around the country about progressive education, and it was charged that the children weren't really learning anything, so we were going to go back to the basics. Boy, you have no idea what an old tune that is. So, okay, we're going to go back to the basics. We're going to get serious. There was an outfit called the Council on Basic Education, which I guess still exists. Okay, no more of that. No more of those frills. No more of this progressivism. We're going to buckle down. So that's 1946. Eight years go by. Sputnik goes up in the sky. And we suddenly find that nobody in our schools knows anything about math and science. So we get a new commission here. We have James Conant, president of Harvard University latest commission has got the president of Yale but he had that had. so here's James Cohen he says well we got to take get rid of all these little small schools and build great big schools so they can have great big fancy science laboratories and hire specialists you know and so forth so uh, at any rate so we get busy doing that one of the worst mistakes we ever made so time flies by 1963 or so we have another big flap because still nobody knows any math so we have the school mathematics study group headed by a professor at Yale University, million dollar budgets. We have uh, Gerald Zacharias and uh, what the heck was it called right here on the Boston area, something about science. You know, we're going to reform math and science again. This is, I say, early 60s. And uh, millions and tens, millions, hundreds of millions of dollars get spent. And then along around the end of the late 60s, Charles Silberman f with a big team from the Carnegie Foundation goes out. And they Crisis in the classroom, they write. You know, kids aren't learning anything. Their curiosity is being turned off. All this bad stuff is happening. So more recommendations. In 1973, about 10 years ago, we had the big back to the back to the basics. The cry went up. Okay, no more fooling around. Now we're really going to do it. You know, back to the basics. Well, for the past four years, state legislatures have been talking about competency tests. You know, the, the states all over the country have been passing tests saying, in effect, well, now, we've been saying that you guys have got to learn this stuff, but now we really mean it. Now you really got to learn this stuff. So, uh, you know, it's it's like watching this turntable go around. Um, it's nothing new. The schools are indeed bad. They were bad before. I think they're probably worse now, as a, and largely as a result of a lot of these reports. The Conant report had the main effect that we closed we started a process of closing down small schools and turning them into big ones, which made things even worse. And the, uh, every one of these reports has, whether or not money gets spent, and usually money does get spent, has the result of reducing the independence and the authority of the autonomy and the responsibility of the classroom teacher. And more and more making the teacher in a factory worker who carries out some kind of a plan that 
whole bunch of people set up some pro somewhere, most of whom probably never taught in a classroom, never laid eyes. I was reading in that same, uh, no, I don't know if it's, yeah, it's in that same issue of the Phoenix. There's a story about Mike Dukakis and his plans for the states on education. And uh, there's a article about his uh, sort of chief advisor on ed education. It's not, not the state commissioner. Mm -hmm. I can't remember the guy's name. And it mentions his background. He's been a something of administration of this and a something of administration of that. He's never set foot in a classroom, certainly not an elementary school classroom. So, as I say, we run this operation, and this has been going on for a lot longer than, I mean, I think this is probably true as long as schools have been there. We run education as if it was a quasi-industrial process in, in which we have some people up at the top designing a product and designing a process which is supposed to produce the product. It's actually really as if we were running a bottling plant, <coughs> you know, and the kids are like empty bottles. And they come down the assembly lines, and we've got these bottle-filling machines full of history, math, so forth and so forth. And they're going to squirt stuff in the bottles until they fill them up with all this good knowledge. Uh, and uh, and every so often we look around, and we find out the bottles are mostly empty. So we say, well, we got to redesign. The, you know, we got the wrong stuff in the tanks there. We got to put this in sooner or that in later. We say the squirter isn't working right. You know, we're not squirting hard enough for. And then we have the problem that some bottles seem to have very narrow mouths and some don't seem to have, what are we going to do about these bottles we can't squirt anything in? All of these assumptions are wrong. Learning is an activity which is carried out by learners. It's interesting. You come to almost the exact opposite conclusions of the people who wrote the cover Newsweek story, which yes. is titled Saving Our Schools. Yes. And I guess they had a little insert piece on Japanese schools. Yes. And that's exactly how they described the Japanese schools as little assembly lines, and they gave it a, overall, I would say, a positive review. And they compared it to our schools, which in the United States, I think several people were quoted as saying that we have so few core choices, there's so much individualism here, that it's basically cafeteria-style uh, choosing of courses. Yes, just what they said 10 years ago, just what they said 10 years before. The Japanese schools are in very tough shape. They're having serious problems of student violence. Suicide has been an even more serious problem among Japanese adolescents uh, than in this country. Within the last couple of years, a woman who happens to run a very, kind of a, a, fem a, a Phil Donahue of Japan, she has an interview show, wrote a book called Toto Chan about her own childhood and schooling. It was a kind of Japanese uh, summer hill. It was a, and the book sold in a year or so, five million copies. So there's a great deal of dissatisfaction uh, with education in, in Japan. And as I say, there's increasing, and, and this in a very, generally speaking, crime-free country, you know, you get one murder a year in a city like Tokyo. Mm -hmm. and, so the Japanese system is not in very good shape, and indeed there are people in Japan, <laughs> it's funny, there are people in Japan who are talking, asking me about my ideas about education, but uh, the, the U.S. Commission didn't. I suspect that the U.S. Commission did not solicit opinions from any elementary school teachers or from any of the people who in the past 10 or 15 years, like myself, I'm only one of a couple of dozen, who wrote books about education that tried to get to the heart of the problem. So basically you're, you're very dissatisfied with this report just as along the line you have been with other reports. Yes, I'm dissatisfied. I, I think it, uh, I have called it a predictable disaster. Uh, when you look at the people they put on the report, uh, put on the team, you could guess what kind of a report was going to come out. And yet are there any pieces of news, any revelations here at all? I mean, they in cite the some statistics, yes, which so I would think would be somewhat of a shock. They'd be a shock if they hadn't been true for... And Fred Heckinger, who is the education editor of the New York Times and a very staunch defender of the status quo in education, a very, I mean, he would consider himself philosophically, I guess, an enemy of mine if he, if he knows I exist. But he wrote sometime in the last couple of years, I remember reading an article of his in the New York Times, which said that even at the turn of the century, most poor kids were flunking out of school, dropping out of school. They're, 
Uh, Colin Greer has written history that has gone into the history of American publication. He points out that when the poor kids in our schools were English, Scottish, Welsh immigrants, in other words, long before there was any question of race or language, strictly WASP stock, they were all flunking out of schools. Now, in the 1900s, it didn't make too much difference because you could get a job anyway, and that's where most people learned most of what they knew. Mm -hmm. There never was a time in which the vast majority of kids who went to school and, and the overwhelming majority of poor kids did not do badly there. There never was a golden age when all that great stuff was being learned. I will say things are probably somewhat worse now, and some of that is is the world's fault, and some it's not all the school's fault. Mm -hmm. As This is a tougher time for kids to grow up and a tougher time to have to deal with kids. But a lot of it is the school's fault. To what do you attribute the decline in competency, i.e. in reading scores and, and SAT test scores? Well, many things. Uh, there is less and less time in school for that strange activity called reading. That is, the more the schools get into reading instruction, which means learning a lot of disconnected skills which have nothing to do with reading, the worse the reading gets. As Bruno Bettelheim pointed out in his book, year after year after year, the word count of school textbooks gets smaller and smaller. So the books get duller and duller. Naturally, the kids get less and less interested in reading. Of course, television and video games have their, you know, they work on the opposite side, but if a kid has a choice of watching, a, of reading any one of three or four miserably dull books, or watching at least a reasonably lively television show, any kid who isn't an idiot is going to watch the TV. I mean, you'd have to be an idiot to voluntarily read most of the stuff they give you to read in school. It's not a lot of fun. It's mm. just terrible. You can't, I mean, unless you've actually looked at some of them, you can't believe how bad they are. There have been, you know, uh, all during these years with all these troubles, there actually have been repeated small-scale experiments done. I say experiments. These weren't laboratory people. These were school teachers mm -hmm. who thought, well, now what would happen if we just put a nice big fat collection of really interesting books in the classroom and gave the kids plenty of time to read them and said, we'll answer your questions if you ask them. Otherwise, we aren't going to bother you. What happens when you do that is the reading scores shoot up through the roof. And under those kinds of regimes where the kids are not constantly being tested and humiliated and exposed and threatened and so forth, where reading becomes a pleasure and adventure, under those circumstances, kids routinely gain two, three, four years of reading skill in a year. James Herndon described it. George Dennison described it. Daniel Fader described it in books that they wrote. I don't believe any of these guys were called up by the commission because commissions like that don't call up those kinds of people. I did it in my own classrooms. How expensive is that sort of education? Cheaper. It's much cheaper. Nothing that needs to be done in so practically nothing that needs to be done in schools needs to cost more money, and a great deal of what would have made schools better would have actually saved money. How does that motivate unmotivated kids? Well, what it does is to give them... You see, you can't motivate people from outside. All you do is bribe and threaten. And a certain per small percentage of the kids do what they do for the bribe. But I was that kind of a kid. I played the school game, but I lost my curiosity and didn't really recover it until I got out in the world. And uh, a few uh, the kids, the A kids, are good at, at playing the game. And they know it's a game. They're good at winning the bribes. The great majority of the kids are not good at playing the game, don't like to play it, don't play it, and a certain majority of them hate it so much they think about ways to burn the school down. Uh, you cannot... You, the point about human beings, this is one of the assumptions, one of the false assumptions on which schools work, and one of these assumptions is embodied in Mr. Lupo's article. One assumption is that Learning is always the product of teaching. I mean, he's, you know, here, here's this teacher's got to spend more time with these six slow learners. The assumption is she's pouring stuff into a bottle, and the bottle has a little teeny neck, so she can't pour it in very fast. It's, you know, it's a very slow process pouring this stuff in, where the others, she could get over the others, she could slosh it right in. 
Learning is not a passive process, and it's not made by teachers. Learners make learning. The other assumption is that, which operates all through our schools, is that kids basically aren't interested in learning. They won't do it unless you make them one way or another, for which motivate is a fancy word. And it's not true the human animal is by nature, and above all when we are young, a yearning, a, a learning animal. But we're, you know, even, even after years of school and the mass media have pounded our brains into lime jello, we're still a pretty curious animal. We're basically a learning creature. It's just something we can't help. And as I say, when we're little, we are passionate learners. Would these type of uh, theories be applicable to inner city schools? Yes, yeah, inner city school kids are no different from any other. They live in a different world. They live in a world which is, generally speaking, poorer in many kinds of experience and richer in bad kinds of experience. As one of the conditions in which learners learn best is a feeling of peace, happiness, security, comfort, confidence. So. Somebody who is living in a situation in which she is under many kinds of pressure and threat is going to be spending a lot of her or his energy thinking about self-defense. Well, you learn a little about self-defense, but you don't have much time to explore the world around you and think about it if you're busy figuring out how to keep your head from getting knocked in. Um, but other than that, no, the human being, the human being is is a learning creature. Furthermore, it is extremely good at learning. Every one of these little inner city kids speaks whatever language her or his parents speak, whether it be Italian or Vietnamese or Chinese or English or black English or whatever. And learning to speak a language is an immense intellectual feat. It's an act of genius and by and large babies come into the world geniuses. Does it alarm you in the way the report described that not one state has any kind of requirements for a foreign language? Not at all. I have... The whole foreign language thing in schools is a big shuck from the word go. If you want kids to learn foreign languages, send them to places where they speak those languages. I mean, I taught for a while at a private school here in Boston, a private secondary school, very good one. Small, lots of money, very, very bright kids, very capable teachers. We had a French teacher there, native-born French woman, while I was there. Extremely competent woman. And liked the kids, kids liked her. She had all the latest jazz, language, labs, audio, visual, all the latest techniques. And after she wrote a report to the head of the school. She said, children take French in this school for four years and they don't, and these are very bright kids and with all the best they don't learn as much French as they'd learn if they spent three months in the country. How are they going to do that? I mean, in a rich private school, I understand, but what about in a public school in the United States? What's the point of teaching? I mean, if you're living in a part of the country where there are, and there, this is true in many parts of the country, let us say Spanish-speaking groups, find some way to make, or here in Italian, you know, we've got lots of people in Boston who speak Italian. If you want kids to learn Italian, send them down in the North End and let them talk to people who speak Italian. But generally speaking, <coughs> human beings learn what they have a need for, what they feel a need for. We're not good at learning stuff because somebody says, hey, someday you may need it. You know, someday it may come in handy. When we see a connection between real life and, and this stuff that we need to learn, then we're good at learning. What about applications to getting jobs in today's world? Uh, how realistic are the sorts of proposals that you're making in terms of, say, high-tech and, and where the jobs really are? Most people who work in high-tech industries don't do skilled labor. I mean, obviously, if Atari can pack up out of Silicon Valley and move to Formosa or Taiwan or, you know, or wherever, the fact is that the actual quality of work for most industrial jobs. The amount of skill, energy, thought, competence has been steadily degraded in this and all other industrial countries for the past 50 years. You had to be smart to be a good machinist in the 1920s. You might not know a lot of books, but you had to know a great many things and you had to make a lot of judgments. You had to use a lot of intelligence. The autom automatization of work 
has has greatly degraded the quality of work. A guy in Australia named Niall Brennan, right after World War II, wrote a book called The Making of a Moron. It was one of the most important books ever written, and like most important books, it disappeared. And he described something. He said, in Australia, when World War II started, uh, I mean, there was a huge drought. All the men in the country were sent off to fight for the Commonwealth much earlier than we got into the war. So they needed people to, to join the workforce. And in one part of Australia, a man near a big city who ran a home for um, a retarded kid. I mean, seriously retarded. 45 IQ, mm -hmm. what would be ordinarily classified as morons in the language. Trainable, TMR, trainable mentally retarded, not considered educable. This guy got the idea that maybe some of the big factories in the area might be able to use some of these kids. Maybe they could work. So he talked, they said, sure, send some of, them, some of them over. These kids were a sensation. The factory, I said, these are the best employees we ever had. Now that tells you something about the skill level of modern work, and it's lower now than it was then. So this idea that, you know, you got to have all these guys learn, you know, learning all this stuff in school so that they can go and work in high tech. This is just nonsense. We can take our industries and if we can put them in some country and train illiterate peasants in a, in a year to do what American workers had been doing before, there is no high skill level involved in modern work. Now, the other thing I want to say about that is that in World War II in this country, we had to train, when we got into the war, we had to train a huge workforce. You know, the men were off in the armed forces. Rosie the Riveter, you're too young to... There were all sorts of songs about you know, enormous numbers of rural people went into the cities, enormous numbers of women, but no training in factory industrial, people who never had a tool in their hands. And they went in to make airplanes, tanks, ships. What did they do? Did they send them all to school? Hell no. They said, took the recruit, this farm boy or girl, this woman who'd never had a anything in her life bigger than a pair of scissors and they took her down to the guy with the welding and they said well whoever was welding they said well now here George here's this new person he she didn't know anything about welding. show her how to weld they didn't go to some school for four years learning about welding they went to where somebody was doing the work and they said to that person show them how to do it and that's how we trained a, a whole industrial workforce in less than a year how do you suppose parents will react to something that I guess a lot of educators would consider, particularly those in power right now, would consider educational anarchy? Well, they won't like it. And it's precisely because they are afraid of what they call anarchy. That is their... My friend Edgar Friedenberg calls them control freaks. <laughs> they think that unless they are planning, managing, running, measuring everything, that nothing is happening. Whereas, in fact, it is their attempts to plan, manage, control, measure that prevent things from happening. They act as, uh, we're back to our bottling plant. What do we put in the bottles? What do we squirt? How, how can we squirt it in? <clears throat> Whereas learning is, in fact, an active process which is carried on by learners. Because they, the learners, want in their different way, to make sense out of the world as they see it and to find some kind of a way to be useful and competent in it. I'm very interested in some of the philosophies you're talking about, but before we continue on that, getting back for a moment to some of the specifics in the report, I guess one problem that is seen in this report and has been seen for quite some time is the decline in the quality and availability of good teachers. Mm-hmm. Is this something that you find yourself uh, in sympathy with, in empathy with? Well, but it's reports like these that drive good teachers out of schools. I have known l many hundreds of good teachers who quit teaching. I got fired two or three times myself. Most of the sort of radical teachers that I'd know. And by the way, I'm talking about teachers who were able to teach the kids that, that other teachers had said couldn't learn. These were the people who turned failure into success, who did the kind of thing that the report talks about. These people get fired from their schools or they, or they quit. And I've known 
talked to, hundreds of them. Their reasons for quitting had nothing to do with money. In fact, private schools pay far less money than public schools and they get better teachers. Mm -hmm. The main reason these teachers quit was first because they could, they could not be in charge of their own classroom. They could not act like the professionals they like to call them. They were constantly being told, you must do this, or you must use these books, or you must make these lesson plans. They're, they were not able to be in charge of their work. They couldn't stand the stupid things that they were told to do, and they couldn't stand, for the most part, being around people who quite obviously didn't like or trust children. They couldn't be, stand being in an atmosphere which was deeply inimical to children. Silberman, in his book, talks about the appalling incivility which adults in schools showed to children, and he and his team visited schools by the hundreds all across the country. So another thing that weeds out good teachers is the awful trash they have to read in schools of education. Many of them just can't stand, you know. But it's been true f well, for f uh, 30, 30 years or more that the people who went into teaching were at the absolute bottom of the academic ladder. Joseph Wood Crutch wrote a book about schools in the early 1950s and made that same finding. It's been consistently true ever since. Probably worse now because at least the schools could catch a certain percentage of able women who now have more of other careers available to them. Mm -hmm. But the fact is that most of the best teachers, and this was in a U.S. News and World Report article which came out only a month or two before this commission report. Most of the most able teachers who go into schools leave within a fair... Tell me something. Uh, if there is this type of freeing up of teachers to do their own thing, that's an overused phrase, but yeah. still, uh, won't there be a great deal of inconsistency in people who are coming out of classrooms? Yes, there is anyway. Yes, this this desperate search for consistency for is another one of the self-made problems of schools. The idea that everybody ought to know the same things. They don't anyway. No two, one of the things you observe, and as I say, nobody on that commission has ever done much observing of how small children really do learn about the world. And anybody who's paid much close attention learns that they, no two of them do it in the same way. No two children learn to speak, to speak in the same way. They have, therefore, the desire to push all children into a single mold, learning mold. It kind of becomes like a bed of Procrustes, if you remember that old Greek legend of this great robber used to capture travelers, and he had a bed in his hideout. And if he put them down the bed, if they were too short, he stretched them till they fit. If they were too long, he chopped them off. Mm. Naturally, not very many people survived that treatment. This is basically what the schools are. If you happen to fit the school pattern, if you can play the school game, if that's the way you like to do things, wow, everybody says you're a hot dog and you go to Harvard and MIT. Uh, actually, I think a great many of the most able people are the ones who get chopped. You can't make it consistent. But I wonder, Mr. Holt, if you can tell me, in your opinion, what has happened to the products of the 60s in what has been termed a progressive education. Was that actually a progressive education they were receiving? And if so, uh, what are the deficits that they've come up with that people are talking about? Well, I was right in the middle of that so-called revolution in education, and what I eventually learned about it was that it was about 99.5% talk and about one-half of 1% action. Uh, I don't want to pretend to have accurate figures when I don't, but the, I would make a guess, and I would have, have a lot of confidence in this guess, that no more than one or at the outside two percent of the children in this country were ever in classrooms which I would have recognized as even being mildly in the direction I favored. I could talk, at, I could defend that one percent guess at great length, but it would take a lot of time. And uh, <clears throat> I traveled widely around the country. I was invited to speak in, I mean, in 
hundreds of lectures a year, and most of the places where I was invited to go were places that had some kind of new program. And what I always discovered is that this never involved more than a tiny fraction of the children in the school system, and most school systems had none whatever. Uh, I, Well, one anecdote. I was once invited by a friend of mine who was then the chief of the Alternative Schools Division of the Office of Education in Washington to sit on a jury which was going to be distributing federal money to school systems, public school systems, for alternative education programs which they which the school systems had devised what the department had done was to I mean they got the money from Congress and they sent out a circular to just something like 20,000 school systems we had in the country at the time mm -hmm. saying we are prepared to fund up to five million or more dollars project K through 12 innovative projects covering a certain number of minimum number of students and time uh, you send us your brief proposals and if we s and those we like we will give a ten thousand dollar planning grant to so that you can prepare a detailed proposal and and the ones of those we like best will fund this big fat millions of dollars out of ten thousand or twenty thousand districts only four hundred sent in anything anything at all of those four hundred only 40 or 50 even seemed worth a planning grant. The rest were so trivial. This was right in the middle of all of that stuff. Of the 40 or 50 that were worth a planning grant, only a, about a, they were weeded down to about a dozen, which was given to us, the, and we, the panel, spent three days in Washington trying to decide, oh, we'd read all this stuff, you know, I worked pretty hard at it, trying to decide which of these should be funded. We funded two of them. We said the third, with a few minor modifications, might be funded. I think later it was. I think there was a second round on the panel, and they funded a couple of more. The only one of those school districts that I happen to know about was the one in Berkeley, because I had friends teaching out there. Mm -hmm. I later asked uh, these friends of mine who had been working in innovative and alternative schools whether their work had been helped by this federal money, and they said no. It was... It was worth. What the local district did was to set up a huge administrative machine so that, whereas before they at least left us alone, now we had to spend all our time not only doing what we were doing, but making reports about it to these guys whose salary would have been enough to run the school. <laughs> so, I mean, that's, I mean, the mountain labored and it brought forth this tiny, pitiful, little shriveled up dried mouse. Very little ever happened. Most of the schools went right on doing what they had always done, mm -hmm. which is, as I say, with the bottle filling operation. If you feel, uh, as you seem to, that teachers are only a segment of the educational uh, process, how important are teachers and uh, what makes a good teacher? Good. A very important question, which the Commission almost certainly did not ask. The most important person in the, in the learning process is the learner. The next most important is the teacher, because what the teacher does, the teacher does not fill up the bottles. It's much more like gardening. You don't grow plants by going out with scotch tape and sticking leaves out of the stems. Plant grows. But the gardener creates as far as she or he can the conditions for growth. The case of plants, soil, fertilizer, acidity, shade, water, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Simple with plants. With children, it's more complicated. What the teacher does, and the parents at home, the teacher does in the school environment is to is to create an environment which is in part physical. I mean, there are books and records and tapes and tools, and in part emotional, spiritual, moral intellectual in which growth can best occur. Mm -hmm. Now that's a very subtle, very difficult, very interesting task. Nobody in school, any school of education that I've ever heard of would describe it that way. It's an, it's an extremely important task. It's not what most teachers think they're supposed to be doing, which is, as I say, filling the bottles, but it's, a, it's an important task in itself. It's, uh, it is by no means trivial, and it is certainly not easy. So where can teachers learn to teach? By teaching. Where do you learn to swim? In the water. Schools of education. 
I promise you, they're like places where you'd spend four years studying courses on hydraulics and the theory of swimming and so forth and so forth. And then finally they say, okay, we've taught you how to swim. Now here's a pool or here's a lake. You learn to teach by teaching. I think there are probably some things. I never had any educational training, luckily. Mm -hmm. I say luckily because I went into the classroom knowing I didn't know anything and therefore realizing that if I wanted to learn something, I better keep my eyes and ears open and think about what I was seeing and hearing. Uh, <coughs> it's the only way you learn about teaching is to do it and to see and see which of your inputs into this environment produce helpful results and which don't and maybe to talk about your problems with other teachers and say well how are you making out you know what <clears throat> now that kind of a structure would help teachers get better aren't you talking about doing a lot of experimenting in, in so far as the teacher is yes. concerned and if that's true aren't the students possibly victims of this they're victims anyway I mean the Commission says they're victims no all your experiments aren't going to work but the experiments they do now don't work only the experiments now aren't being done by people who are in the classroom looking at these people, but by some, you know, some character 500 or 1,000 or 2,000 miles away, very often somebody who never, never was in a classroom. Now, all life is an experiment in a very real sense of the word. Teaching is a profound, in that sense, a profoundly experimental activity. But the only experiments that will ever improve education are experiments done by teachers in their own classrooms. In talking about this smorgasbord of uh, availability that we've had and in criticizing it, uh, Edward Moulton, this is in Newsweek, was the chancellor of the Ohio Board of Regents, says that anybody who has raised children knows that they would rather play basketball than mow the grass, but if they know they must mow the grass, they will. It's typical again. This is the this is the children will never do anything good unless we make them. And as I say, this informs and corrupts the entire educational process. All you have to do, and I do it because because we have little. <clears throat> I have in my office two three days a week a little visitor. She's now 22 months old. She's been there since she was 10 months. But I've been watching little babies and little children learn for 20 years now. All you have to do is. Spend a little time around a young human being and watch and listen and think a little bit about what you're seeing and you will see that there is nothing more important to a small human animal than finding out what's going on. I mean, the, the single most harmful I idea of all the ideas that have undone our schools and schools in all other countries, there are no, there's no country in the world in which the schools are producing these kinds of miracles. Single most harmful idea is the idea that children won't learn unless they're made to. And the second is that they won't do it unless you show them how. And as long as I say, as long as we cling to those assumptions, we're trying to get the Washington heading north. And as I say, I don't care how many presidential commissions come in or how much money they spend or what they do, the results are going to be bad. I don't know whether I've been saying this for 25 years, and as I say, not only nobody, people don't listen, I don't know. I don't know how bad things may have to get before more people do listen. They've been getting steadily worse. I agree, schools are quite considerably worse now than they were 15 years ago, in some cases for reasons which are out in society, but in many cases for reasons which lie in the schools. I was going to say, aren't things going in the exact opposite direction right now than you're talking about? Oh, yes, absolutely. Behavior modification, learning disabilities. Uh, no, it's the bottle. It's the bottle filling operation. If you can't fill the bottle, you say there's something wrong with the bottle. Uh, talking pr pragmatically about uh, unions, teachers, uh, daily demands, basically, um, by people who are in the business of education. Can you tell me, for example, it says here in Newsweek that uh, both of the large unions in the United States, both of the large teachers unions, right now stand opposed to uh, merit pay for teachers. I'm wondering what your feeling is about that. Well, 
who's going to decide who has merit since it is consistently the best teachers who get fired from schools or run out of schools uh, I mean it's the, the, the same people are you know, how do you decide uh, merit one of the things I've been saying about learning for 25 years now is that it can't be measured it can't be quantified it can certainly be observed it can certainly be noticed an observant and thoughtful person can tell the difference between a child who's actively engaged with the world and one who isn't but you can't measure it in numbers but all of these decisions about so-called merit are going to be based on these ridiculous uh, so-called achievement tests which are just nonsense rubbish what achievement test measures I guess how well you take an achievement test or how well you took it on that day it doesn't measure anything else reading tests have nothing to do with reading they have everything to do with reading tests <laughs> So we spend more and more of our time in school learning how to pass reading tests and math tests. Now that's inherently a dull, stupid activity. So naturally children do less and less of it. So naturally the test scores go lower and lower. So naturally people say, presidential commission say, well, we've got to really teach them to pass these tests. Where people, as I said earlier in the program, where we put kids in contact with a big mess of books and say, and give them plenty of time to read. In most schools, a child wouldn't get 15 minutes a week of uninterrupted reading. Not even that much. If we gave, said, hours a day, if you want to read, that's number one priority. Just read this stuff. Don't worry about it. If you want to ask us about a word or ask us what it means, or you know, you want to get some help, come and ask for it, but otherwise we're not going to bother you. We're not going to grade you. We're not going to quiz you. Read for pleasure. Read for adventure. Read for excitement. Where that happened? up go the scores. Daniel Fader, who's a professor of education at the University of Michigan, wrote a book about it called Hooked on Books. Other people have written about it, as I say, George Dennison, James Herndon, myself. And the schools and these commissions, they don't want to learn from these experiences, or they seem incapable of learning from these experiences. Good books make good readers. You mentioned before that, in your feeling, the educational experience is decided by first the learner and then the teacher, where do things such as funding come in on the scale? Well, teachers have to get paid. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I think I would like to see some kind of version of voucher plan. I would like to see teachers, the bosses, in their own classrooms. I would like to see schools small. 200 is absolute maximum, 100 better. For little kids, 50 better than that. And how many in a classroom? Doesn't make all that much difference. Uh, uh, as long as there's enough space. I mean, the old one-room schoolhouse was a model that we never should have given up. Children of many different ages in contact with each other so that littler ones learn from the big one. I'd like to see a great variety of schools so the parents would have a wide choice if you didn't like what Mrs. X or Mr. Y was doing with your kids, you could go talk to them and say, hey, I want more of this or less of that. I mean, people used to do that with me when I was a classroom teacher. And if Mrs. X or Mr. Y says, well, no, we don't want to do that, okay, you've got a hundred other little schools you can go to, you can find something else. Mm -hmm. Give up this nitwit quest for uniformity. Say, let's have the greatest possible variety so parents can shop around. The funding, I don't know, you could do it with voucher plans, you could do it lots of different ways. Even with these giant school factories that we've erected, there isn't any reason why, just as in this big office building we're in here, how many companies? Are 30, 40 companies in here? I wouldn't say that many, but... 20, whatever. Something. I mean, the, the, the people who manage the building don't tell you how to run this radio station. They run the building more or less well, you know, the lights go on, the elevator more or less works. The, <laughs> but uh, there's no reason why you couldn't have... A, a, a giant school building with 20 or 34 or, or small schools in it, independently managed, administered with their own programs. And the big building would supply certain kinds of common services. And if you had a gym, you know, the schools would take a turn, or the little schools might rent space in certain larger facilities. Uh, the, f the, f the finances of all this could be worked out. You would actually would have a lot fewer administrators than we do now. You sound like all of this is secondary to, to what you've been talking about in the past. 
Oh yes, I don't think you. I mean, I, I think I'm. I publish a magazine called Growing Without Schooling, which is for and about people who teach their own kids at home. I mean, I don't think to have learning happen, you have to have special places where nothing else happens, and I think that in itself is a nutty idea. But I will accept as a kind of social fact that we're stuck for the next generation or two of these big schools and that most kids are going to be going to them. Mm -hmm. So I think, how can we make them be, be better if they could learn in and from the world in the mainstream of adult life if a couple of them could be here with us in the radio studio seeing what we do here and seeing how real life is lived by people. Mm -hmm. As long as we're stuck with these places, I think we could make them into very much better places for children to learn than they are now. And it wouldn't cost more money. I mean, George Dennison, in his book, The Lives of Children, which I'll bet nobody on this fool commission ever read, and it was one of the two or three most important books about education that I've ever seen, talked about a little private school in New York, private school for poor kids, all of them, a third of them black, a third Hispanic, a third white, but all poor. Most of them kicked out of their previous schools. Most of them declared to be non-learners or two, three, four years behind grade level behavior problems. These children succeeded just, I mean, beyond anybody's wildest dreams. This school costs less money per pupil than what the schools in New York cost at the time. It doesn't cost, well, of course, a lot of administrators are going to have to get out of their offices and go back into the classroom and go to work. I mean, we certainly can't afford the percentage of non-teaching personnel that we have in our school system. And that's difficult because they control them. I and mean, these guys aren't going to vote themselves out of jobs, so I don't know. I mean, that's, that's, you've got a political task there, which is difficult. Mm. But uh, well, schools would be substantially better if, as, if one thing, without doing anything else, we made them a lot smaller. And they'd be substantially better, I think, if just across the board we fired three-quarters of or, or retrained or something, three quarters of teaching person of non-teaching personnel in the school. Mm -hmm. Just cut down the the non-teaching, uh, you know, to, to one tenth of its present size, and the schools would probably get better. But uh, that's not going to happen in the near future. You sound very similar to President Reagan, not in terms, of course, of educational no, I know. philosophy, but you do sound. Very, very. It sounds familiar in the sense of his it's rather frightening to me because I don't <laughs> like to think of that I agree with him about anything. <laughs> this and his reasons are not the same as mine. We don't. I mean, uh, he doesn't really give much of a damn about schools and children and teachers. And I give every kind of a damn. But I'm with him in two things. I don't think the answer to the problem is more money. If you're going north, as I say trying to get to Washington, the more money you spend, the worse off you are. And I do think that a decentralization of educational power and authority is absolutely essential. But I go much farther than he does. I mean, I say the, the pyramid's upside down. The chief actor in the drama should be the child, the learner, the second, the number two, the teacher, and then the ad such administrators whose job it would be to serve the teachers and help them to create this learning environment. And then you know, the, or we've got the we've got the child on the bottom of the the child is the empty bottle and the teacher is the factory worker trying to figure out how to fill the bottle. Do you believe what it says here in Newsweek, this conclusion that the evidence suggests that Americans desperately want improvement in public schools? No. I think by and large, what well improvement? I don't know what I mean. What are definitions? What I think most people want from schools is that it first place they want a place to get their kids out of the way because they don't want them around the house or in the job or on the streets so it's a it's to an important degree a day jail for kids it's <laughs> preventive preventive detention have them in there so they're not doing something bad somewhere the second place it's a kind of a grading and labeling operation I mean most people would like their you know they'd like their kids to be winners but school is basically a machine for putting winner labels on a few people and losers on the rest. And finally, it, what most people want is for their kids to learn is not math or history or English or anything else, but shut up, do what you're told, don't make a fuss. 
and uh, which is what uh, now those are there are people who, there are lots of people who may want the schools to do other things but they insist on these three things and part of what I say as long as the schools have to do those three as long as they're their primary tasks day jail grading and labeling and teaching about real life meaning boredom alienation powerlessness apathy mass consumption getting them ready for teaching them that life is tough as long as schools have those tasks they're not going to be able to do any other tasks and you can have your choice you can teach it you can try it doesn't work too well as we can see you can try to teach kids shut up sit still do what you're told don't make a fez fuss but then you got to give up all this jazz about shakespeare computers creativity democratic values you can't do those two things in the same place they don't they don't go together no i don't think most people want their children to be questioning truly intellectual oh many do i mean it's a hard question to answer i if i have to give a show the schools are doing what most people want them to do only just not as well as they would like like them to but the adult population of america doesn't read books and doesn't particularly care whether their kids do the adult population doesn't know any math and a random sample of adults on any american street would not pass a fourth grade more than 50 percent would fail a fourth grade math test multi-place multi multiplication no very few people could do it or uh, no, fourth grade that's third grade fourth grade would be multi-place division forget it i doubt if a third of the adult population of this country could do multi-place division as far as fractions goes forget it completely mm. it's not useful people don't know it they know what they want is they they want to see their kids sitting at there in those desks with not moving with frowns on their faces they want to see a little kind of assembly line in there and uh, i'll tell you one thing if it's any evidence at all there's a lot of things that have been drilled into my head mechanically and yet i realize i don't know them at all if you know what i'm saying yeah yeah i do realize that. and if that if that's evidence in any way of what you're saying uh, now, what I will say, having said that about a majority, I will say there is a growing minority of people, I think a fairly small minority, but I think growing and certain to continue to grow, which does indeed want something quite different. And these are a lot of the people who are teaching their kids at home. These are the people that I have a lot of contact with, and growing without schooling. I say to them, if you can find a, a school where your kids are having a great learning experience, that's terrific. And there are some out there but I don't think there are very many and if you don't find one then you better think about doing it yourself because I don't believe that outfit out there is going to change and certainly it's not going to change because of these kinds of reports I asked you before uh, what you would label your work as a pol as a consultant an educational consultant or whatever it seems like you're an educational philosopher first. yeah I am a teacher and a